war on terrorism. And we're so honored to be joined by the senior uniformed officer in the United States to discuss what is emerging as the dominating question of, of the moment or perhaps our time, which is longer for some of us than others, but nevertheless, it's a great, great moment uh, and, and a terrible challenge to us. Uh, and we're absolutely delighted that General Pace is here to discuss it with us. His career in the military, uh, beginning with his appointment as a lieutenant, graduating from the Naval Academy in 1967, has been marked by great success, as you all can understand. Uh, he served in Vietnam as a rifle platoon commander. He held nearly every level of command over the next 25 years. Uh, he was uh, president of the Marine Corps University, and during that time served two stints in Somalia. First of all, the deputy commander of Marine Forces there, and then deputy commander of the task force in Somalia. Uh, he served on the Joint Chiefs, uh, the staff of the Joint Chiefs, as a J3, Director of Operations. He was also uh, the commander of Southern Command, and I think before that had uh, been, command of Marine, been commander of Marine Forces, uh, Atlantic Europe South. And then in the year 2001, he was appointed, the first Marine to be appointed, as the uh, Deputy Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And then, as you all know, in September of 2005, he became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, some of you have seen him on television. You know this is going to be a wonderful program tonight. We're absolutely delighted to have such an authoritative figure uh, address us on this absolutely vital question. It's my great pleasure to present General Peter Pace. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. I'm very, very kind of you to introduce me that way, and I appreciate it. It's great uh, for Lynn and I to be here with you tonight, uh, and I mean that sincerely, uh, to be here in Baltimore, uh, this uh, city, uh, such a great uh, legacy and heritage and uh, history for our country. Uh, we landed over at the fort, and uh, that's Unbelievably, the first time in my life I've ever been to Fort McHenry. Right? I, I, gotta, I, need, I need to fix that. I really do. I mean, I thought about that. I said, how, how, how could you live in Annapolis for so many years and then in Washington for so many years and not go to the place where the, which was, you know, inspired the uh, Star Spangled Banner? So I need to come back and fix that. But it's great, great to be here with you all. I do want to answer your questions tonight. Uh, and I, we'll spend most of our time doing that. But I would like to thank the lady who uh, walked, ran into on the way in tonight who said, I look too young to be a general. Ma'am, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I owe an apology, I think, to uh, the gentleman who was in the men's room with me. You know, it was kind of crowded in there, so I went, I went into one of the uh, places with doors on him, and uh, I heard uh, somebody say, you know, uh, this better be good, I'm going to miss 24 tonight. <laughs> Sir, I recommend you leave now. <laughs> There's a couple of reasons why I'm standing in front of you um, with a smile on my face and why I feel really proud uh, to be with you. One is, uh, and I'm going to embarrass him on purpose, there's a great Marine Major and three of his Marines over here in Marine Blues. Uh, Major Fulford, would you stand up, please, for just a second? And real, real Marine. Stand up, guys. I suspect I've missed uh, a service or two perhaps in here who are doing the same thing, but I recognize them when I walked in the door. They're your local recruiters, and uh, some of you may be a little too old to do that. <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is that uh, they work real hard to get the right kind of men and women to join our services. Not only the Marines who are here, but the Army, Air Force, uh, Navy, all put some really great individuals into the recruiting force so they can kind of clone themselves. Uh, it is a service responsibility 
to train and equip and maintain and take good care of those who join our ranks. It's a national responsibility. We're sorry, we can't hear you. You can't hear. Oh, thanks. Sorry. And I don't know what to do here without another mic. Uh, I'll try it louder. Thanks. How about now? Well, the, the mics are tied down and I can't squat down. So. <laughs> Let me try something. I'll just yell at you. I'll pretend I'm a Marine. But what I was saying was it's our responsibility once we get uh, young men and women into our ranks to be, uh, to take good care of them and, and to respect them and give them the right kinds of missions. It's a national responsibility to assist the services in finding the right young men and women. So I would simply ask you all tonight, uh, if you have a young man or woman uh, who's contemplating serving the country in one of the armed services, please uh, encourage them to do so. It's, a, it's an honorable thing to do to serve this nation. Uh, and as you all know, because many of you already have, uh, you'll never regret a day that you, sit, that you spend out of your life serving the United States of America. There are several things that I do that really make me proud to be an American. One uh, happened uh, last Thursday when I went up uh, to the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee, and as I do from time to time, sitting next to the Secretary of Defense, sat in front of the Senate of the United States and answered their questions for about three hours in open form. And then we left there and we went to the House and for any member of the House who wanted to spend time in uh, classified session asking questions, we did that for about an hour or so, and then we went back over to the Senate uh, and did the same thing in, in closed session. As a citizen of the United States, I enjoy participating in that. It's not fun when you're sitting there asking or answering some of the hard questions, but it's rewarding to have the opportunity to do that. And as a citizen of the United States, to know that the senior appointed officials of the land get to come on down and answer our elected officials' questions really makes me feel good about, about this country and who we are. Another thing that I did uh, last week and will do again tomorrow is uh, press conferences. Again, for those of us who have positions of influence to stand in front of the press in the United States and answer their questions is a privilege and a responsibility. And it's great that this country has the free press that it does have. I believe in a strong military, but if you gave me a choice of only a free press or a strong military, I would pick the free press. Fortunately for the kind of person I am, we don't have to make that choice. <laughs> but if you think about it, um, strong militaries do not, do not make free countries. Free presses make free countries. The last several months, we brought out a quadrennial defense review which is, as the name implies, every four years, a good look at the U.S. military, where we are today, where we need to be 20 years from now, how we're spending our money to ensure that we are, in fact, headed toward the right kinds of capacities for the future and spending your, your tax dollars wisely. God bless you, man. We also had the FY07 budget that was just sent up to the Hill, which looked at the immediate coming 12 months with the same kinds of priorities. And then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has a responsibility every other year to report to the Congress independently about your military's capacity to execute all of the missions that may be assigned to us 
over the coming years. And I was proud to write to the Congress that we are able to execute any missions that may come our way. I tell you all that because I, I don't want to speak at you about those unless you want to ask questions about, about those things. But if you do, uh, I'd be happy, happy to answer. I should at least touch briefly on Iraq and Afghanistan as opening comments, and then we will go to your questions. First of all, Afghanistan. There's a country uh, that is making uh, very, very solid strides in bringing peace and representative government to their people. And I think we can all take pride in our part in making that possible. President Karzai now and his parliament are able to lead that country into the future that they want to have for themselves. I do not know how many people in this room have been to Afghanistan. I get back there about every six months. And the change that, has, that I see when I go back on that kind of uh, frequency is truly amazing. If you go to downtown Kabul today, you'll find traffic jams. Now in Baltimore and Washington, we don't necessarily appreciate traffic jams. But in a city that rarely had cars on the streets three years ago, to see traffic jams, to see glass in all the store windows, to see young children, boys and girls, going to school, to see all the cranes that are there building, it makes you feel good about the future in Afghanistan. Iraq is a place that is having some real difficulties right now. There's several different ways I can and will talk to you about this. First and most importantly, the Iraqi people themselves are standing at a crossroads. And they are making critical decisions for their country right now about which road they'll take. Everything is in place if they want to have a civil war. Everything is also in place if they want to have a, united, a unified future. And what we have seen so far since the bombing of the Golden Dome is that the Iraqi people, Kurds, Shia, Sunni, their elected leaders and their religious leaders have all said, we don't want to go down the Civil War Road. All the people in authority are calling for calm. Not all, most are calling for calm. Their military has been loyal to the central government and has provided stability on the streets, as have their policemen in uniform. This is not to put a huge smiley face on this. About eight days ago, not, this past, not yesterday, Sunday, but the week before Sunday, I was on um, Meet the Press and was asked a question how it was going. And I answered in a way that in my head made sense but didn't come across as precisely as I would have liked. I said things were going very well. What I meant to say was they were going very well in training up the police, in training up the armed forces, in leaders in the country calling for calm. I certainly did not mean it to mean that at that moment in time that the country was, the country was calm. So I need to be very careful about how I speak in public. And we should not have a great big smiley face about this because there's still a lot of work to do. But we cannot be defeated militarily, nor can the Iraqi people get to their future through force of arms. We need the military and the police U.S. coalition, and most importantly, Iraqi, 
to provide stability so that the elected government in Iraq can begin to provide the kinds of services that allow the Iraqi people to believe that their future underneath an elected government is going to be better than a future underneath some kind of terrorist leadership. I know you'll have more questions about that, so I'll wait for your questions. Elsewhere in the global war on terror, it's important as best we can. I'll be right with you, sir. Be right with you, sir. It's okay. Not yet, sir. But I'll come back to you. I'll, but I will not forget your shirt. I'll come right back to you. I'll summarize since I can tell I there's a question. In addition to fighting the nation's battles, in 2005, your armed forces provided relief to tsunami victims in the Pacific, relief to hurricane victims here at home, relief to earthquake victims in Pakistan. I can tell you that your armed forces enjoy being able to assist others, not that they need to be assisted because of the calamities that they're facing, but it feels good to have the capacity to help and be able to. And I do believe that that is the true spirit of America and that the times when our federal citizens around the world need our help and we're able to reach out like we have in Indonesia, like we have in Pakistan and elsewhere, that those who do not know the United States any other way and see us in relief operations understand uh, the goodness of the heart of the American people. With that, sir, I will turn to your question. I could never understand after we toppled Saddam Hussein why our government didn't tell all three factions of Iraqi and the world and our country, this country of Iraq belongs to you people, we wish you'd form a democracy, and all the oil reserves, we don't want them, we'll buy them, but they belong to you people. Every one of you owns it. The Saddam Hussein's had it before. So my question is, I don't understand why we have never emphasized that, and we don't emphasize it right now for the rest of the war in there, that you can give $50,000 to the 27 million Iraqis, and it'd still only be a trillion dollars. They must have more than that in the oil reserves. So it seems like we should be emphasizing that so we don't keep losing people. So we... We, we definitely need to continue to tell the Iraqi people that their nation is their nation, their resources, including their oil, is their oil. Their government and the people who elect that government will decide how to spend their resources. We have had to overcome 30 years of tyranny in the form of Saddam Hussein. We have had to overcome 30 years of neglect of the oil infrastructure to be able to get enough oil to the markets. But clearly, uh, for those who have not heard it, it is most definitely the policy of the United States that we will uh, respect uh, the right of the Iraqi people to pick their own future and to spend their own resources the way that they determine through their elected leadership. Would it be more accurate to, say, to re refer to the war on terror as a war against that tiny fraction of Islam that is engaged in anti-Western activities and how would we know when we have won this war or is this war a call for a perpetual state of warfare? First, I believe it's correct to understand that terrorism is not a religion and that terrorists are from other than the Muslim religion. In our own hemisphere, for example, the narco-terrorists in Colombia are not Muslim number one. Number two, it is fair to say that inside the Muslim religion that those who are terrorists are acting absolutely counter to the teachings of that religion. So they are the extreme end of the belief that is the wonderful religion that Muslims uh, in the great majority practice uh, 
peacefully. What was your last part, sir? How will we know? Ah, yeah. Thank you. There will not be uh, the USS Missouri in the Gulf with some kind of a peace treaty signing that's going to end the war. You will see over time a diminishment in the terrorist activities. I would, my best analogy I, that I can give you is that in any city there is crime, but that the police and the government keep that crime below a level at which the vast majority of people can carry out their daily lives and live the way they want to. And that's really the end state that you will see for terrorism. It is not that there will not be any terrorists in the world, but that collectively as a community of nations, we will have been able to take enough action against them, had enough government stand up and pro provide for their uh, citizens, that the amount of terrorism is below the level at which free societies can continue to function. But this will be a long war. If you look at any terrorist organization, it takes 20 or 30 years to overcome their ideology. That does not mean 20 or 30 years of 130,000 troops in Iraq. That can come down in a relatively short period of time. It does mean 20 or 30 years of your military, your police, and other countries' military and police being on guard and being able to act quickly against cells around the world who would do us harm. Uh, in the past 56 years, there probably have been more terrorist incidents in Israel than in the rest of the world combined. And the largest so-called terrorist groups, Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, are all related to the Palestinian situation. Many people I know believe that the 56-year-old Arab-Israeli conflict must be resolved, hopefully through United States leadership and honest broker diplomacy, before there can be an end to Islamic terrorism. What are your thoughts on that? I do not know if it's before or as a part of, but it is certainly an integral part of finding a solution to which all can feel good about who they are, where they live, that their beliefs have been uh, listened to and taken care of. And fundamental to that is finding a solution to Palestine and the Arab-Israeli uh, problem. That's fundamental. Whether or not it has to be first or part of, I do not know. But I do know we must collectively find a way to solve that problem. For those of us old enough to remember the Cold War and detente, how real is the nuclear threat from Iran? Are we heading back toward times where we have to worry about an imminent attack? And what military options are there to deal with it? First of all, today, uh, to the best of my knowledge, Iran does not currently have a nuclear weapon. They do have a nuclear program that can produce the materials that could be made into a weapon. Uh, the European countries, France, Germany, the uh, United Kingdom, and Russia, are in the lead right now in trying to persuade Iran to respect the will of the international community for them not to become a nuclear power, not to not have nuclear power energy, but not to have nuclear weapons. And I have, um, I believe that there is a great deal more that can be done diplomatically amongst all the nations of the world to find the proper solution to that challenge to world peace. Without respect to any particular country, I would tell you that you have 2.4 million American men and women active 
Guard and Reserve who are serving this country uh, tonight in one capacity or another. Of that 2.4 million, 205,000 are currently deployed to the Gulf region. That leaves you a little bit over 2 million who are available to this nation to take care of any particular problem that might arise. I don't say that glibly, I just say that as a fact, that this nation has enormous residual capacity in its military to handle any challenge that may come our way regardless of the country that might pose the problem. I do not expect to need it because we have it. And because we have it, I believe we don't need it, won't need it. But my responsibility, and those, those like me in uniform, is to ensure that we are prepared to handle the challenges that come ahead. And that's why I said uh, in February, uh, I think it was February 7th, I sent a uh, assessment to the Congress of the United States about our ability to execute all of the missions we might be called upon to, ex to execute. And I told our Congress that it was my judgment and that of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that we were fully prepared to do that. We have, of course, as a result of this Iraqi situation, I don't believe we had a lot of, of uh, terrorists in Iraq until really we went in and encouraged a lot of them to come to fight <laughs> against the situation there. But if we have a war on terrorism, which we are talking about, and the president is very verbal on this, what are the particular yardsticks on which we can declare a victory. And I say this because we have a number of detainees that have been as many as three and four years incommunicado, and they will probably not be released until we have a victory. I, I believe that on September 10th, 2001, we were a nation at war. We just did not know it yet. On September 11, 2001, it became apparent to us that our enemies would strike us as they could. It is not at all clear to me, in fact, I reject the notion that these enemies who have published, just like Hitler published Mein Kampf, these enemies have published how they plan on first taking over all countries Muslim and then subjugating the rest of the world. They would just as soon come in here and bomb this assembly as do anything else tonight. And they sure would not want any people under their control to have the opportunity to do what we're doing right now. Second. And I've gone brain dead on the last thing you said, but it was important. I was concerned about the yardsticks. Yes, thank you. Allow, allow the <clears throat> Got it. Thank you, sir. The, the yardstick is what I mentioned before, which is when the level of terrorism around the globe is below the level at which free societies can function the way they should for their individuals. And the incommunicado individuals in Guantanamo are communicating that if we let them free, they will seek a way to kill us. We do not want to be jailers to the world in Guantanamo. I would welcome a useful suggestion on how we can deal with these individuals who we cannot send home to some of their countries because we must have that country's guarantee that they will treat them as well as we have been treating them. And we cannot get that from all those countries. We cannot let them go uh, if they are going to attack us and they say that they're going to attack us. So it is not a good situation, but they are being treated humanely and well they are enemy combatants, and I, I would be 
happy to hear a recommendation about how we might otherwise as a country deal with these individuals who, if let loose, will attack us again. We have, we have begun the trials, and, and as you know, that has been starts and fits because, understandably, as you go to move people to trial, uh, defense attorneys do what they do, which is try to, uh, um, uh, to, they'll try to, they do defend their uh, uh, constituent in whatever way they can, and that, that has slowed down some of the, some of the uh, trials as well. So uh, in this uniform, I can only tell you that I know that these individu individuals have pledged to uh, attack us again. We need to find a solution uh, to this problem that allows us to, to deal with them humanely, uh, deal with them justly, uh, but not let them attack us again. General, uh, our nation's leaders, our government, uh, tells us that the terrorists hate us for who we are, for our freedoms and other things. But when the terrorists speak from bin Laden on down, they say they hate us for our actions, for our policies. And the two specific ones, our support of Israel's occupation of the Palestinians, our own occupation of Iraq. Why don't we at least discuss these issues, have a dialogue on these issues, rather than reject them out of hand? Uh, I, I'm not aware of any uh, terrorists like UBL, Zawahiris, or Kawi offering to meet to have a discussion. If that was their point, then it sure would have been nice if they sent us a telegram on the 10th of September and said, sure would like to meet. They didn't do that. They sent planes and killed 3,000 people. Nobody wants peace more than those who wear the uniform. So if there were some dialogue to be had, I'd love to see it take place. But I do believe, in my heart of hearts, that there's a segment of this terrorist element that must be captured or killed because they hate more than they love and they'd rather attack than talk. Have you ever been in a position where your own experience and your own judgment has been in conflict with the policies and decisions of the national administration. <laughs> that, that, that's a great question, and I'm going to answer it. That's a great question for you to, an, for you to ask the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Let me tell you what my, day, let me tell you what my days are like, and I will, I will answer you precisely, but I'd like to tell you why I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I spend a minimum of one hour a day with the Secretary of Defense. I spend normally four or five hours with him, and like we did last Friday, eight or nine hours discussing the issues that impact the military. I go routinely to the White House scheduled three times a week to meet with the National Security Council, which is the President, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and several other cabinet level officials. I meet with the Secretary of Defense and the President uh, in a very small group inside the Oval Office about once a week. So I have ample opportunity to express my views, to be heard, and where I think a potential
policy is going awry to speak my mind. And I will tell you that one of the um, most rewarding parts of what I do is the way that the, the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States have made me feel uh, responsible to them and to the nation to speak out, especially if my thoughts are, are different than the, than the general tone of the conversation. Because of that, because not only have I been afforded hours and hours every week to be able to do that, but also because it is my sworn obligation and duty to the nation to do so. By the time a decision is made, I have already had my opportunity to impact. And therefore, in the time that I was vice chairman for four years and the six months since I have been chairman, all of my concerns were listened to and accommodated inside of the dialogue that I had with the leadership of, this, of the country responsible for making the decisions. So I have not been faced with the specific question you asked because that's not how uh, this government makes decisions. Myself, the other five uh, Joint Chiefs, all of the combatant commanders who are the four-star commanders around the world are expected to are encouraged to give our best advice, and we do so, and we are listened to. So I've not been put in a position that you would, that you would say. It was reported in the Baltimore Sun this morning that uh, Great Britain is uh, contemplating some troop withdrawals from Iraq, and uh, other countries, as you know, have from time to time withdrawn some troops. And it seems like the, quote, coalition, close quote, is becoming more and more the United, a unilateral thing. The United States troops are taking more and more of the uh, burden. So I was wondering if that concerns you, and how does, that, how does that play against the possibility of troop withdrawals for our country, since that's been mentioned a few times, and although the president hasn't endorsed it, uh, there seems to be a leaning toward it. There has never been a troop uh, modification, up or down, uh, that we did not know about ahead of time. It's part of the open dialogue amongst uh, the military leaders on the ground and amongst the governments. With regard to uh, the United Kingdom, it is true that their numbers will be coming down a little bit, but not because they've decided to cut back on X number of people. They are swapping out one kind of a uh, regiment for another kind, and the new one going in is smaller than the one that's, is the one that's coming out. It's possible that the next one that goes in would be larger than that one. So it, the result that is going to take place over the next couple of weeks is down a couple of hundred of their soldiers based on unit um, uh, organization, not on, not on uh, political decision uh, to skinny down. We had, uh, at the height, going into the elections, we had a baseline force of about 138,000 U.S. just before the December elections. Getting ready for the elections, we bumped that up to about 160,000. As a result of the elections, we decided that we could not only come back down to the 138, but take out two of our 17 combat brigades further, taking us down to about 130, 132,000. So uh, if, the, if you wanted to just look at that, the U.S. is coming down about seven or 8,000. And we had open dialogue with our U.K. counterparts. And they are, for a different reason, coming down a little bit. So it's not at all out of uh, proportion uh, to uh, need, needs in the ground. Each nation is going to make its own sovereign decisions about how many, how long. Military to military, we have a very open dialogue with all of our friends, and we are not surprised when they make a public announcement about what they're going to do. And then State Department to 
various foreign ministries around the world, that dialogue takes place as far as the, the, the politics of, of, the, uh, of the decisions. But I'm very comfortable with, I think we have uh, 34 countries with us in Iraq and 42 with us in Afghanistan, but I may be off by one or, one or two countries. I am not a soldier. I have never worn the uniform of the United States. However, I believe it is every citizen's duty to be vigilant. I was very much distressed at the statements of your General Abazide about people like myself who expressed grave concern about the United Arab Emirates operating here in the port of Baltimore. We were accused of being Arab bashers and Islamophobes. Another example of this sort of thing is when we speak out about the tremendous influx of illegal aliens into this country and our poorest border with Mexico. We are accused of being, and I quote, racist, xenophobes, nativists, and I could go on and on. I don't see how people can be vigilant and have to put up, and I don't see why we should have to put up with statements that are so ugly and defamatory. And I really was very upset about what General Abazide had to say about people like me. Thank you. Where'd you go, ma'am? Oh, no, I've got you. No, 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 please. No, that's okay. Please, please do sit down. I just want to look at you when no, I talk no, to you. No, no, no. Thanks. That's okay. I love it. Um, I love it. I've never talked to a general. <laughs> I've, never, I've never had this opportunity with a general before. I mean, this is incredible. <laughs> I mean, thank you very much. No, I would be very happy to discuss it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was standing next to General Abizade when he made the comments he made. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you that he was not talking at you as an individual or at a group of individuals who say certain things. What he said, and I know because I've had a long discussion with him, and uh, let me switch out of he, who he is and into who I am, <clears throat> is that it is, it is not the vigilance that should concern us. That's good. It is not the questioning of the wisdom of a particular policy. That is good. What is not healthy for this country is to not have the opportunity for all the voices to be heard, for the dialogue to be complete, so that if you are right, those who are thinking differently can learn from you. And if others have facts that you don't have, so that you can learn from them. So for example, to my knowledge, the country, our country, never got to absorb the fact that the security of Baltimore is, has been, and will always be the responsibility of the US Coast Guard. That what was being discussed was the company that was going to handle the containers that come on and off ships. That's being done by Chinese companies on both ends of the Panama Canal. It's being loaded on those ships by companies from other countries. It's being unloaded in the United States at the majority of our ports by companies that are not US owned. So the fact that we question whether or not that is a wise policy is good, but to take a, country, a uh, company that is owned by folks from the United Arab Emirates and to make a leap that that would be a threat to our ports without an open dialogue about things like more of our ships visit ports in the UAE than any other place in the world other than our own ports. Everything we have asked them to do since September 11, 2001 in the war on terrorism, they have done for us. There are things that they are doing that I cannot tell you about from this platform that have enormously helped us. They were the first nation to offer 
help to this country after Katrina. A hundred million dollar check. My only point is that somehow before we all rush to a judgment either for or against, we ought to allow ourselves as a nation to have an open dialogue, take the time necessary to inform ourselves, and then make a decision about which we can be proud. How can the American people be proud or not of the decision that was made without, without full knowledge of what was happening? So that's, that's what it is. Terrorism is outrageous. What is, I'm sorry? Terrorism is outrageous. And glorification of terrorism is, is equally outrageous. But the rate which which the terrorism is increasing is also outrageous. The rate with which the spread of terrorism is, is also outrageous is, is, is much more than what it was yeah, increasing. You know, it's, the, the world is now all enveloped with terrorism. But equally, the silence against injustice is also outrageous. And when we said that we are dealing with the problems of terrorism, uh, we have several fronts in it. And one of them is to resolve the Palestinian issue. The disparity between our efforts is so phenomenal that uh, to give a little sense, uh, just like we were galvanized by 9-11, the people in the Muslim world get galvanized with the injustice and, and the plight of the Palestinians. And that sense we have to convey to ourselves in making effort, a balanced effort, you know, in uh, promoting what you just said, that we have to do both things. But I notice, and other people notice, that there is a great disparity in our efforts in, uh, in resolving the issue of the Palestinians. And your question, sir, is? is that, the question is, that, is, why don't we pay more attention to the Palestinian problem, I believe, General? Is that correct? Yeah, now th that sense that there is a great disparity, does that, is their uh, administration is, uh, has sense of that? Or? Um, I'm way outside my lane as a military guy. Um, I will tell you what I do know and what I don't know. I do know that we fundamentally must find a solution to the Palestinian problem for everyone involved so people can get on about living their lives. We, as I mentioned before, I don't know if that comes first or second, but it's got to be part of the overall problem that we, that we face for all those folks, regardless of which side you may find yourself on, who feel um, injustice. I do not know how much effort is going into that. Not, not something that would normally come across my desk. I do believe that there is an enormous amount of effort going into that to include, historically, a couple of times when uh, folks came to Camp David and came close to solutions. And I suspect that whatever amount of effort's going on right now, that it is best done out of um, the limelight so that folks uh, of serious um, consequence can sit down with each other and have a dialogue without the Klieg lights and having to um, appear in public one way and have a dialogue some other way. So I, so I do not know, but I, but I do know that there is effort right now by our government, but I could not weigh that effort for you, nor, sh nor should I try. Uh, my question, sir, you, you mentioned yourself that this will be a long war, and I've even heard some people compare it to Vietnam, uh, but we always hear a lot about the combat operations. What about the changes and the improvements in infrastructure that the Army's been so instrumental in? Is that going to be something that we continue to play a major role in, sir? And if so, will, will our training change, or will we 
try to hand that over at some point soon to the Iraqis or other NGOs. First, uh, thank you for being willing to serve your country. Uh, second, uh, one of the uh, lessons we have learned uh, from uh, the past several years is the need for U.S. military support to other uh, parts of the U.S. government and uh, non-government agencies from other countries, et cetera. So it is part of our doctrine now that we will be prepared in support of another lead federal agency uh, to be able to help uh, with the kinds of things like, re like reconstruction. That is not uh, something that the U.S. military has to be in long term, but it is certainly something that when you, when you are in a country uh, initially, uh, you need to facilitate uh, as quickly as you can so that the, um, the folks whose primary job it is can get into the country and, and, and take over. And that, that belongs in the State Department's uh, bailiwick, but we need to facilitate that early on and then support, uh, through, if nothing else, uh, security operations uh, while it's going on. Yes, General, as a prior service Army guy, uh, I'll give you a softball after all those tough questions. And by the way, we were told that USMC stands for Uncle Sam's Misguided Children. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm not sure I'll get out of here all right. I'm going to need any of you Army guys to escort me out the door. Uh, this question's uh, on behalf of my brother, who's also prior service. He was an infantry officer, Russell, Ridge. and uh, he wants to know a technical question just about the restructuring. Well, Russell, you should have come up here, but I wanted to ask the question. Uh, I outranked him. So uh, you see in the Army, particularly with the brigade uh, strikers, striker brigades and the brigade combat teams and restructuring toward a modularization and a more uh, quicker, faster sort of force, do you see that? with the other branches down the road, and when you do your sort of quadrennial review, where do you see our forces, say, in five or 10 years, and what would you say to the young kids that are out there today that are thinking about joining? First of all, I would tell any young person who's thinking about joining, thank you for considering serving this country. And if you do decide to join up, whether it's for four years or 40 years, I promise you that the time you spend serving your country will be time that you will always be proud of. That's what I would tell a young person today. And I, and I mean it, and I know it's true. Uh, second, the Army is uh, restructuring itself. It's kind of like driving the car while you're working on the engine because they're in combat yet they're changing. We had, a, we had an army about three years ago that was division size structured, 16, 17, 16 17,000 individuals that could only go in that size. General Schoomaker and his team have reconfigured the army into four or 5,000 man brigades that are in, independent and modular so they can go plug and play by themselves or with others. The, Striker Brigade is an example of the kinds of technology that our industry is able to provide us that gives us incredible mobility and uh, security on the battlefield. So I am very pleased with the direction the Army is going because it's going to provide to the nation a much more flexible, robust, uh, active Army that rely, relies less on the Guard and Reserve for day-to-day -day operations and will rely more on the Guard and Reserve for uh, threats to, uh, to, to the nation um, that they signed up for um, X, X years ago. With regard to uh, the other services, this is going to, it's hard for me to say this, uh, but I'll say it anyway, I'm wearing the un wrong uniform, uh, but the Marines uh, will not have to change that much because they are already configured the way the Army is training to or changing to be configured, which is a good thing for the nation. But the Marines are uh, looking to provide more of their capacity to the special operations world. So if you have the Army becoming more like the Marines and you have the Marines becoming more like special operations, that's not a very clear uh, picture, 
but it's kind of the direction that they're going, which then allows you to have a force that can still operate if some other nation um, were to challenge us nation to nation, it still allows you to have that capacity uh, into the future. And oh, by the way, an important capacity to have because as long as we have it, folks may very well be deterred from spending enough of their money to get strong enough to overcome our uh, conventional force. So it's a good insurance policy for the nation to have both to keep those, like keeping a, a, a lock on a door uh, for an honest person. But it allows you then to have the other part of your force properly configured to do the um, work that needs to be done against cells of terrorists wherever they happen to be around the world. Small, specially trained, light, mobile, lethal uh, groups, 10 to 100, who can get out and about quickly. So you, you'll see both those ends of the spectrum uh, coming forward so we can deal with today's problem but be ready for the one that we're not thinking about. 10 September 2001, to my knowledge, nobody in the U.S. military was thinking about operating on the ground in Afghanistan. About four weeks later, we were. So you need a military that has capabilities, and you need to be able to look out and think about the kinds of threats that we will face, not who, but the kinds of threats that we can face, and be prepared for those, because a threat is two parts. One is capability, and the other is intent. You can measure the capability of the world to produce certain kinds of uh, equipment, certain kinds of military capacity. You cannot as accurately measure other countries' intent. And therefore, you have to be prepared in case the capability marries up with someone whose intent is inimical to ours. I feel uh, bad that one has to, as I do, play the role of moderator and remind everybody that it's 10 minutes after 7. We try very hard to end our periods on, on time. Um, General, you have a most appreciative audience. You're grateful.